We're now going to go into a series of three videos that talk about measurement analysis. Measurement analysis is really the core of the uh, uh, technology issues that we're going to deal with in this, this measure phase. And when we think about this, we see that many times we really don't understand what our measurement system is all about. For instance, many times we have a metric, a very high level indicator of performance for an organization. So for instance, many organizations today will use something like earnings before interest and taxes, or EBIT. The problem with these types of measures is that we really can't see that measure, earnings before interest and taxes, at the operational level of a process. Customer satisfaction is another one. We don't see that at the operational level of the process. So to make those measures meaningful, we have to decompose them. So we have a sort of a family of measures. And so those measures will get broken into sub-measures, and then we'll stratify them or assign them to different areas. So we'll understand them with different logic filters. So one logic filter may be by the person who's engaged in the process. Another may be by product. Another may be by region or by sales office. Another may be by time history. So what we start seeing is that the measurement system itself is a complex combination of different uh, factors that define performance. Now, performance measurement systems have a variety of problems. There are problems due to the integrity of the data itself. So many times, we don't actually keep the data very well, and we have missing data, or we haven't observed the data, or it hasn't been completed by people. Sometimes it's due to the definition of the performance measure. So we might be talking about on-time delivery, and we don't identify clearly what do we mean by the start and the finish. Sometimes it's based on the objectivity of the observer. If I'm asked to report on myself and my own performance about something, I might not actually be very willing to call my failures an actual failure. And so maybe I want to call it something else or blame someone else on it. Maybe it's due to the scale of the measurement and recording, that we haven't used the measurement or recorded the information in a fine enough scale or in the proper type of data. So for instance, I might have been taking a look at a process and I just say, okay, I've got another unit shipped, another unit shipped, another unit shipped, another unit shipped, but I can't really tell you what the quality of any of those units were. They just passed the acceptance test. Did they barely pass it? Did I test one multiple times and then it passed and then I finally then let it pass? How good was the pass? I don't understand the quality of the indicator, just the performance of the decision that was made about that indicator. Many times we'll average raw data, and we say on average we're operating at this throughput rate. But the throughput rate may be very high one hour and very low another because we're doing different things. Maybe we've combined, combined factors in ways that are actually totally meaningless. And so we might say we're going to talk about loyalty of customers. What does loyalty of customer really mean? Well, many organizations have customer satisfaction index, and they define loyalty as willingness to actually uh, recommend their product or service to someone else. But is that really loyalty? That doesn't mean that you actually did recommend it. It's just a statement of will. And it doesn't mean actually that you're going to repurchase again. So you may have a high willingness to recommend and also a very high switching behavior. So what we really care about is not the intent of the customer, it's the actual action. Sometimes it's due to sampling or data management. So if we collect data, for instance, and we were collecting data and say, we're living here in Finland, and we say the average number of children per family is 2.1. Now, who has 2.1 children? Nobody. Why is it a problem? Because we took attribute data, the names of people, we assigned those number of names to a number of people that are in a family. We counted those discrete names. But that discreteness, then, we turned into a variable scale to analyze it as an average. In reality, we cannot have 2.1 children in any family. We can have a median of two or a median of three, depending on where the average breaks and frequency of occurrence. So sometimes we've actually done our data collection and reporting in such a way that we've actually destroyed the underlying uh, importance of what is the information. So what does it take to have a good measure? One that can be used that's accountable and uh, that is going to be something that we can actually use in terms of performance prediction in an organization. Well, <clears throat> there's been a, a publication uh, 
by Professor Kai Christensen in Aarhus University in Denmark about accountable business performance measures. And he gives us a number of things we should think about. First of all is transparency and verifiability. This means that the measures are public and available for inspection. Relevant, that they are related to the structural context for performance that we want to have out of our process model. They should be reliable, that's the degree to which the observed variation is due to the true effect signal rather than to some randomness, noise, and so that the process measure is a high signal to noise ratio. They should also be precise, and that means that they give us predictive power and some degree of uncertainty that we say is capable of uh, making a sound decision and also that we can demonstrate. The measures should also be robust. And robustness doesn't mean that means that they don't significantly deteriorate over time. That with changes, the measurements actually perform in an expected way. And they should also be valid. valid. That means that the whole system uh, consistently and adequately represents the underlying causal uh, structure of what's happening in the operations. So if we look at those, we see if we're going to be understanding, we have to understand that we are actually in the measurement systems looking back, we're monitoring what's called experiential knowledge. Experience is what we do when we are seeing what actually happened in the real world. So experience knowledge we build by observation, uh, perception, we interpret it, we represent it graphically some way, and then we can communicate it. Another type of knowledge, though, is experimental. This is when we try something out. This is when we're trying something new. And here, this knowledge is generated by exercising an experiment where we consciously go and change factors to find out what would happen if. This is management, which some organizations have called what-if management. And so if we want to understand different circumstances and their effect, in other words, if we want to understand causality, we have to do experimental analysis. We have to gain that type of knowledge. Experiential analysis is good to show us not causation, but correlation. It's good to say, here are hints about things that can relate together, but it doesn't actually prove that those things do relate together. So if we want to solve a problem, we have to have some form of experimentation. That's what we're going to do analysis for, to analyze experiential information. The improve phase is going to tell us about experimental knowledge and demonstrate the causality of the systems that we have. <clears throat> now, one thing that happens many times in data is we take a look and there are lots of different kinds of data. So sometimes you'll see a manager or an engineer who's got lots of experience say, you know, I know what the problem is. This happened back in my old organization exactly this way. Well, that's not data. That's an anecdote. And the plural of anecdotes, many stories, is not data. What we want to do is analyze using two specific critical tools, statistical analysis of the flow of the cycle time and the process definition charts. And this is what we've been building in the measure phase. We want to understand how the graphical flow of the process is represented, how it can fail, and then with adequate statistics explain exactly what happens to that process over time. So good measurements. They should be actionable. We should know what to do about them. They should be auditable. We should be able to go back and say what really happened. They should be standardized across comparable units so that we can compare those units for the same types of performance. They should be reliable in that they actually will indicate an in-process measure the predicted result. They should be timely. We shouldn't have to wait around for the data to be able to understand what's going on at the real moment. It should be close to real time. We should also be capable of validation against an external system. If my process is doing this way, how does that compare to the same process at some other organization or the way the process was designed if I'm going to be comparing equipment that was manufactured by a company versus how I'm operating it? They should be related to the defects, costs, and cycle time, the kernel measures, if you will, of process performance. And furthermore, they should be owned by the process manager. That means they're committed to using them and the team members in the process, that they are using them and they're taking care to record the data. And when that data is also predictive against the final results, we have a very sound system. And if it reflects also the expectations of all the shareholders or the stakeholders in the process, then we have a system that we can use in a very robust manner to be able to understand what's going on in the process.
So these are the criteria of goodness that we have to think about the measurement system. Now, we're going to move into two more sections on this measurement systems analysis. We've given you sort of an idea of the selection of the measurement system, how we evaluate the methodology of measuring, and setting up the, the measurement itself. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go into the how do we physically describe the adequacy of the measurement system and say, is it good enough for us to be able to make a scientific estimation of process performance? So come back and we'll talk about the next phase of measurement systems analysis and how we do that using Minitab.